Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to lecture number 30 of Pakistan Studies. The title is Course Review. Today we will review what we have covered in this course during the earlier lectures. This course has given basic information and data on Pakistan and the environment within which we are living. It is designed to provide a better understanding of the past and the present with the objective of exploring the prospects for the future. In this course, we have covered five major areas. One, ideology of Pakistan. Second, Pakistan movement. Third, the establishment of the new state in 1947. Constitution making, constitution and constitutional history. Fourth, basic data on Pakistan. Fifth, foreign policy of Pakistan. Let's take up the first major issue that in this course, that is the ideology of Pakistan. We have discussed the notion of ideology and then with the help of that definition and notion of ideology, we have discussed the ideology of Pakistan. We can define ideology as a set of beliefs, values and ideals a group and a, no a nation subscribes to. This is ingrained deeply in the conscience of the people over a period of time. Ideology stands for certain basic principles. They are six in number which we have discussed and I would briefly mention these here. Number one, ideology emphasizes principles, ideals and values for the future. Two, ideology reviews the existing political, social and economic arrangements and passes judgments on it. Three, ideology gives you a consciousness which is based on the basic principles of ideology. Four, it calls for commitment to the principles and a sense of direction. Five, it legitimizes certain actions and delegitimizes certain other actions. Number six, we have to talk about the leadership's role, a leadership that upholds the ideology, propagates the ideology and then mobilizes people on that basis. Keeping in view this definition of ideology and basic principles of ideology, we have discussed ideology of Pakistan. And here we start with two nation theory. Two nation theory emphasizes that there are two major nations in this subcontinent and Muslims 
are a separate distinct socio political and cultural identity and a nation muslims are a nation with distinct history cultural heritage names and nomenclatures and an outlook of life and outlook on life this consciousness or this identity of muslim being nation was provided and buttressed by islam and its world view islam played the core and central role in developing this thinking there were other factors you could talk about history you could talk about political experience you could talk about economic considerations but all these factors clustered around the core issue or core identity that is islam or muslims and this became the basis of political movement in india this identity or consciousness developed gradually over a period of time and in order to understand how this consciousness this thinking this perspective developed one has to examine the pakistan movement which is the second major area covered in this course the study of pakistan movement clearly demonstrates how muslims of this region in this connection we can say muslims of british india began to think in terms of a separate identity a separate nation what were the factors that contributed to it can be identified if we examine the pakistan movement furthermore if we want to understand why did muslims of british india demand a separate state separate state of pakistan that can also be understood by a review of history especially from 1857 to 1947 during these 90 years this political consciousness began to take a definite shape which we have discussed in our course after 1857 the muslims of british india faced a changed environment and changed conditions this was primarily because of the establishment of the british colonial rule second over a period of time a new elite developed amongst the muslims these were the people who had western education who understood the problems and were conscious of the rights and duties third factor that played a role was the competition that developed 
between the Muslims, especially the Muslim elite that developed in British India and the majority community. In the course, we have discussed in detail the efforts made by Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan and his colleagues, contemporaries, for spreading education, modern education, western education amongst the Muslims, so that they have the required qualifications and educational requirements to compete for jobs and to play a role in a system which the colonial rulers had established in British India. This was the changed situation and then gradually the Muslims organized themselves politically starting from 1906 when they established the Muslim League and we have covered all the major developments from that time from the time of the efforts of Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan to establish educational institution to start a movement for regeneration of the Muslims to 1947 when the separate state of Pakistan came into being. If we review all this period, we find that in the initial stages, the Muslim leadership in the Muslim League and outside the Muslim League were demanding safeguards constitutional guarantees and were asking for a federal system in India because they thought that if constitutional guarantees are given, if constitutional and legal safeguards are established, then the distinct Muslim identity, their cultural identity, their political identity, their rights and interests and their future would be adequately safeguarded. The reason why they were asking for a federal system was the same. They were of the view that if a federal system is established in India, with autonomy to the provinces, then Muslims in Muslim majority area would be able to run their affairs in the light of the principles, values and ideology which is the hallmark characteristic feature of their identity. So if we look at Lucknow Pact, which we have discussed in detail, we find the same ideas are there where Muslim League uh, presents certain demands for preservation of identity of Muslims and the Congress accepts that. If you examine Muslim reaction to Nehru report, you will find the same phenomena. qaid -e azams 14 points, which we have discussed in detail. The position which the Muslims took during the roundtable conferences held in 1930, 31 and 32 present the same notion. Safeguards, guarantees, securities, commitments 
for the protection and promotion of their identity, their cultural heritage, their civilization. It was at the later stage that they demanded a separate state. It was in March 1940 when the Muslim League held its annual session in the city of Lahore that Muslim League formally demanded a separate homeland for Muslims of South Asia. And during the next seven years, 1940 to 1947, this demand became the most popular demand of Muslims all over India. And the Muslim League, which led the independence movement, was able to mobilize Muslims for this demand. Number of development shaped this outlook. Nehru report is one significant document that alienated the Muslims from the Congress party because it had rejected all the guarantees, all the safeguards they had committed in the Lucknow Pact of 1916. So this was first kind of awakening that the majority community will not give them the guarantees. We can also talk about the experience of Muslims under the Congress ministries of 37 and 39 which we have discussed in detail. That Congress rule in provinces for the first time demonstrated to the Muslims what would be their fate if whole of India is handed over to them. And that experience which was a bitter experience made them to review the whole notion of safeguards and a federation. That is why from 1938 onwards different Muslim groups began to talk about separation and in 1940 came the Lahore Resolution or Pakistan Resolution. We can also talk about the cabinet mission plan which also provided some kind of opportunity for a political arrangement but the Congress rejected that and Muslims were convinced that their political future, their national identity can only be protected if they have the separate state which they got on 14th August 1947. This discussion of all this year is basically designed to give you not only a historical perspective on the efforts to create the separate state of Pakistan, but also to highlight the factors and the development that made that thinking and consciousness of being Muslim relevant to the political process. That is how Muslim identity of Muslims of South Asia, which goes back to the early periods, became relevant in the political process, became a symbol of political identity, an instrument of political mobilization that led to the establishment of Pakistan. The third part of this course deals with Pakistan's political history since establishment. And 
In this section, we have talked about the problems, difficulties Pakistan faced in the early years. What efforts were made to set up a new state of Pakistan? Pakistan came into existence under exceptionally difficult circumstances and conditions. Many British observers thought that Pakistani state would crumble, would collapse under the weight of its problems. It was the efforts made by the leaders of Pakistan and the commitment of the people of Pakistan to this state and, no and notion of nationhood that Pakistan overcame the problems in the early years. Pakistan not only survived but flourished over the years. That is what we have highlighted here in the discussion. Then we have discussed constitutional developments. Through what stages the constitution of Pakistan, that is the 1956 constitution was framed. First, we, we have discussed the problems that the constitution makers had to deal with. The whole process of constitution making was undertaken by two constituent assemblies of Pakistan. The first constituent assembly of Pakistan functioned from 1947 to 1954. In October 1954, the first constituent assembly was dissolved. Then second constituent assembly came into existence in 1955. And this constituent assembly in a period of less than one year, finalized the 1956 constitution. In order to formulate the first constitution, that is 1956 constitution, the two constituent assemblies had to deal with six major constitutional issues. These issues were federalism or nature of federation, second representation, how federal units should be represented in the federal legislature, third issue dealt by the constituent assembly related to the electoral system, whether Pakistan should have separate electorate or joint electorate. The fourth issue related to question of the national language. What should be the national language of Pakistan, Urdu or both Urdu and Bengali. That was the national uh, language issue. Then they also dealt with the issue of the system, that is whether Pakistan should have presidential system or parliamentary system of government. And the general conclusion was that Pakistan would have parliamentary system of government and this, this system 
was incorporated in the 1956 constitution. We have also discussed the making of the one unit scheme which was done by the second uh, constituent assembly. So with all these efforts, with all these issues uh, tackled by the constituent assembly, the 1956 constitution was uh, framed by February 1956 and it was enforced in March 20, March 1956 to be more precise on March 23rd, 1956. Similarly, we have discussed constitution making for the 1962 constitution. What were the stages? What was the process through which the military government of Ayub Khan framed the 1962 constitution? Similarly, we have discussed the making of the 1973 constitution, the stages in constitution making, the efforts that were made in 1972 and 1973 for framing the 1973 constitution. Then we have discussed the main features of these three constitution, the 1956 constitution, which was parliamentary system of government, 1962 constitution, which was a presidential system with concentration of power at the top, the 1973 constitution, that was and continues to be a parliamentary system of government. But nature of relationship between the president and the prime minister has changed over the years within the framework of the 1973 constitution. Initially, president was weak, very weak in the 73 constitution. In 85, President's powers were enhanced. 97, President's powers were reduced. And year 2002, the President's power were again enhanced. So this is how things have changed, but actually we are following the 1973 constitution with changes that have been made in that constitution from time to time. Then we have discussed the political history of Pakistan and here first we focused on the period from 1947 to 1971. Then we have talked about the period 1972 to the present. During the first period 1947 to 1971, in the first 11 years 1947 to 1958, the political governments were functioning, political leaders were running the affairs of the state. In 1958, there was first military takeover led by General, later Field Marshal Ayub Khan. He ruled the country under martial law from 1958 to 1962. In 1962, he introduced the new constitution that is often described as the 1962 constitution. 
So from 1962 to 1969, Pakistan was under this constitution, that is 1962 constitution. In 1969, there was another military takeover in Pakistan, led by General Yahya Khan, and he ruled the country under martial law from March 1969 to December 1971. In December 1971, East Pakistan separated from Pakistan after a civil war and India-Pakistan war. After the military debacle in East Pakistan, General Yahya Khan handed over power to civilian ruler Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. This marks the beginning of the second phase, 72 to the present. From December 1971, more precise, 20th December 1971 till 5th July 1977, Pakistan had civilian government and first under the interim constitution, then under the 1973 constitution. In 1985, partyless elections were held and civilian governments were installed and by the end of 1985 martial law was withdrawn. So from 85 till 99 Pakistan had different civilian governments. Governments led by different political leaders and political parties. On 12th October 99, there was fourth military takeover in Pakistan led by General Pervez Musharraf who was army chief at that time. From 1999 to year 2002, Pakistan was under military rule and the 73 constitution was held in abeyance. In October 2002, elections were held and Pakistan gradually returned back to civilian and constitutional rule. So this is in brief the summary of the political history that we have discussed here in some detail. The fourth part of this course has presented basic information on data on Pakistan. The objective was to provide you factual information about geographic conditions, geography, geographic environment, Pakistan's territorial boundaries, and the neighborhood. What are the countries that are Pakistan's neighbor? In addition to this, we discussed natural resources because natural resources are an asset, are strength of a country. We talked about 
एग्रीकल्चर पाकिस्तान इज एन एग्रीकल्चरल स्टेट एंड ओवर फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ पाकिस्तान पॉपुलेशन डिपेंड्स ऑन एग्रीकल्चर एंड रिलेटेड एक्टिविटीज सो वी डिस्कस्ड द नेचर ऑफ एग्रीकल्चर वट आर द मेजर क्रॉप्स ऑफ पाकिस्तान and how we could improve agriculture especially the output and this was to make all of us conscious that this is one area where pakistan's prosperity is dependent on we talked about industry and industrialization how and why industry is important how industry is linked with the efforts to modernize the state and in what manner industry ensures economic development and stability what are different kinds of major industries in pakistan what are the areas where we need to concentrate on and we talked not only about this civilian industry but also about defense related industry what major strides pakistan has made in these areas then we talked about education education is an important indicator of socio economic development of a society education is investment in national development education is a process through which you turn individuals into citizens you equip your people with qualifications with training with knowledge for playing a constructive role in the society this helps an individual to become part of the process of national reconstruction therefore education is key to development to progress to economic vitality and overall direction of the state we talked about the educational system in pakistan the efforts to improve education system what are the problems and deficiencies that need to be taken care of and we emphasize that literacy rate in pakistan is low and this becomes even lower when we talk of women literacy why we discussed these basic features or basic uh, data the reason is that all these things that is geography environment industry agriculture education these influence 
the domestic choices a nation makes and the policies a state pursues. I can give you an example how geography influences the policy options. Pakistan is a fortunate country. It has direct access to sea. We have long coastline along the Arabian Sea. And sea access is an important channel for trade. There are countries in the world that do not have direct access to sea. They are called landlocked states. Afghanistan, the neighbor of Pakistan, is a landlocked state. It has no direct access to sea. Another country in the same situation is Nepal, a neighboring state of Pakistan. Nepal doesn't have direct access to sea. Now, this kind of geographic location influences the domestic choices and foreign policy choices. Afghanistan and Nepal have to depend on the neighboring states for their trade, whether you are talking of import or export. What kind of boundaries you have, whether you have good relations with neighboring states, that influences the type of policy you follow. To what extent your country is industrialized? Pakistan is partly industrialized. It is in better shape than a large number of developing countries, so far as industry and modern technology is, is concerned. But still, we have to make more effort. We have to do a lot to become more industrialized and to adopt modern technology in Pakistan. Therefore, we have discussed all those facts and data so that you have an idea of the economic potential of Pakistan and you also realize about the areas where we have to pay attention for improvement of Pakistan's economy and overall development and prosperity of the people. The last section of this course dealt with foreign policy. We have talked about neighborhood and we have talked about the problems that a country faces if it doesn't have access to sea. In fact, all these matters fall in the domain of foreign policy or external relations. We have argued in our discussions that no country can live in isolation. A country has to interact with the rest of the world. The reason being, there is a linkage between domestic conditions, domestic development and external environment. Many of the policies that we pursue within the domestic framework depend on the type of relations we cultivate with the rest of the world. I give you an example. Pakistan pays great attention to economic planning, economic development. Pakistan government 
is embarking on various projects, on various plans for reducing poverty, for improving the quality of life for ordinary people. These are the goals of Pakistan's economic policy and Pakistan's uh, approach to social problems. Now, Pakistan cannot achieve goals in these areas without international cooperation and international support. You need financial assistance from abroad for undertaking development projects and development plans, plans to eradicate poverty. So you need financial assistance in the forms of grant and also loans. Pakistan also needs technical and technological assistance from abroad for Pakistan's industrialization external linkages are important some of the industry that has been set up in Pakistan has been because of the external cooperation China has played a significant role in Pakistan's industrialization. Russia or former Soviet Union established steel mill in Karachi. United States and other Western countries, Japan, have contributed to Pakistan's industrial development. Pakistan's foreign policy is geared to protect Pakistan's independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. That's one primary consideration of foreign policy of Pakistan. In addition to this, Pakistan's foreign policy promotes national interest how national interest is to be protected. Pakistan also believes in friendship with all nations on the basis of sovereign equality, non-interference in each other's internal affairs, ties on the basis of common areas, common interests, common grounds and mutually advantageous considerations. Pakistan also believes in peaceful resolution of conflicts and has full faith in United Nations Charter. The United Nations and other regional organizations are international forum to which Pakistan is associated. In other words, foreign policy has been an important area with which Pakistan deals and handles. This concludes our review of the course and today we have tried to highlight the objective of this course which was introduced in the beginning and the area that we have covered in our lectures and the objective was as I stated earlier to provide a better understanding of Pakistan, its environment, that means about ourself. Thank you and Khuda Hafiz.